Ronnie Whelan could play, by the way. And let me tell you, he's talking about people being dirty when you could tackle. He was filthy. Oh, really? Oh, oh yeah. Dearie me. Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. OTB Sports Radio. You're all very welcome along. My name is Ashling O'Reilly and this is the little preview of the All-Ireland Ladies Gaelic Football Finals. It's a double header this Sunday at Crow Park. It's Mead versus Westmead at 1.15, followed by the senior final with Dublin versus Cork at 3.30pm. Dublin, of course, are going for that four in a row. Little are the official retail partner to the LGFA and have shown their hashtag series support by investing over 4 million since 2016. So you can show your support by tuning in to the All-Ireland Finals live on TG Cahar this weekend. I'm delighted to be joined by my three guests. We have Ashling Sheridan from Cavan. We have Mayo's Sarah Rowe and Tipperary's Ashling Maloney. Girls, you're very welcome. Hello. Oh, thank you. First right. things first, I was thinking uh, this is going to be fun with three Ashlings. I don't know how we're going to get on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. So I'll start with uh, Sarah and Ashling Sheridan. So how are you getting on? I know you're in Australia at the minute and you're in quarantine. So Sarah, you might talk us through and give us a sense of what it's like exactly from the minute you landed in Australia and what happens. Um, so the minute you land, you basically come off the plane and you're directed by security guards and guards and all that. And you have to go through like you've loads of forms and stuff to fill out and like legalities. And then you sit down and you social distance in the airport and you wait for a bus to come and collect you. And, you know, you're allowed your phones or whatever, but you, like you can't take pictures. You can't do anything like they're what watching everything you're doing masks on all that and then you go outside and you get into a bus with like maybe like 10 other people and then you get dropped right to the hotel and straight up to the room and close the door essentially you're not allowed out even a step outside your door for the two weeks then so so yeah it's been um we are on day five now at the moment myself and Ashleen are right beside each other I can literally knock on her room but I can't see her can't see her <laughs> Um, <laughs> so even though she's in next door yeah. and you did travel together, they still they they don't let you even be in your own little support bubble. No, no. nothing, um, no interaction at all. Like as in, we would sometimes stick our head out the door at the same time to collect our food, and like we <sighs> might glimpse, get a glimpse of each other, and we'd absolutely because we've had no social interaction, we'd literally be in knots laughing. Like, but we can't, <laughs> we can't even do. <laughs> We can't even get into each other. Oh, God. And Ashling, have you been able to, I don't know, do any fitness or, I don't know, Zoom workouts or what have you been trying to do to stay sane? Yeah, well, we're very lucky, I suppose, because um, the AFL were able to kind of sort us exercise bikes in our room. And then we also got like a 12 kg kettlebell, a skip and rope and two dumbbells. And then we were also told bring resistance bands or something small like that. So... We actually have a good bit and then um, we're doing hit workouts as well. Myself and Sarah are video calling each other, um, <laughs> playing the music and then doing the workouts together. Um, so we actually have a good routine in that sense and we're getting our workouts in, getting them done early because you're up quite early. They wake you, yeah, like when they're dropping off the food, they knock the door. But um, in terms of fitness, we're, we're very lucky to have actually equipment in the room because you get sick of walking up and down the room now yeah. trying to get the 10,000 steps in <laughs> quite easy. And it must be hard as well for the two of you, is just in terms of being in isolation, you're away from home and it's so close to Christmas as well. Is it tough, that side of things? It is. Um, you go on. Or... You go on. <laughs> <laughs> this is the for you. Uh, well, it is and it is. And I think, like, as everyone was saying, probably the same with Sarah before you were um, coming out here, you know, it's in a sense, it's probably a good Christmas to be missing at home because things aren't the same. Mm -hmm. And... Another thing was our flight was supposed to land um, in Adelaide and we were actually wouldn't have been getting out of quarantine till Stephen's Day, whereas I think here we're getting out Christmas night, so we still get a chance to celebrate some of Christmas. And with the time zone difference, that would be when people in Ireland would be waking up. So in my sense, I'm kind of just like, oh, I'm very thankful um, that I actually am getting out just in time for Christmas. And it was something that you can't, couldn't really control and it was just going to happen. So I think we kind of both prepared for it before we, we got here. Um, so, yeah, at least we get out just in time, I suppose. Yeah, you're excited yeah, for I the think... opportunity. Sarah, what is it like for you? 
Um, I think like for me, it's like I'm looking out the window and I'm like, that's actually a distant memory that I could actually go outside and just go outside whenever I felt like it. So for me, it's like I, there's no option there. So it just takes away that whole kind of like I really want something because you just know you can't. So yeah. I think I and as well with being away from family and friends again, it's just like, you know, you're accept you've accepted the situation a long mm -hmm. time ago that it is what it is. And, you know, I think like being in here locked up in a room, like, you know, you've a lot of time to reflect and kind of um I suppose see where you're at and like you become so conscious, like you become conscious of absolutely everything you do. Like I'm taking my phone out of the charger and I'm like, Why did like why did you do that? I'm getting a cup of coffee, it's taking ages. I'm like you know, it's a big, everything is a big deal in quarantine, I find. I feel like I'm just so conscious of every little thing I do, I'm aware. So um, I think that, I suppose, living in the, the world we live in at home, it's like an absolute rat race. And, you know, mm. you come here and you're like, you get that time and space to yourself, which is actually kind of time and space that I'm actually really enjoying. So I kind of think it's needed in one way. And, um, you know, it, it definitely will teach us a lot, I think. And it is character building, definitely. Yeah, that's it. It's a good way to look at it. It is everything has been changed so much in the last year, but say the previous year, it probably especially for you girls, it was probably just madness all the time. Go, 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 on to the next thing. So you've sort of got a chance to just sit back and to look and to think and reflect, as you said. And obviously the the AFL over there, the AFLW, it's growing so much with so many Irish girls going over. Do you think that is a positive for, for ladies football here in Ireland or is it something probably that we should take positives from and build on? Sarah? Yeah, I definitely think it's, um, I think it's really positive. Um, I think like if I was to reflect on my time over here the last two years that I've, I've learned so much about myself, I've learned so much about the professional environment and I think that you can only, you know, you can only gain coming over here and being on your own, being away from your family and friends, like it does really force you to grow up and kind of um, start to figure out who you are and what you want to be and what you want to do. So I think, um, I suppose, speaking from my perspective, I think it's brilliant that you can, I suppose, bring some learnings at all home with you and try kind of um, take them into your team or whatever. But I think, yeah, it's, it's hard on ladies football that, you know, essentially you're taking some players from the league, but like you'd hope that they'd come back in championship and be able to um, still have an impact and still play still play a role. And we're fortunate enough at the moment to be able to play both sports, but there probably will come a time where a decision is going to have to be made. And, you know, then that's up to the individual as to what they want to do going forward. Yeah, definitely. And Ashley Sheridan, what do you think? Do you think it's maybe an advantage for ladies football? Yeah, I definitely think it is because it's it's showcasing the talent as well mm. that's in ladies football. You know, there's a lot of players that's currently playing now back home in Ireland that would be well fit to come out here mm. and step into that professional environment. You know, the way we train at home is quite similar here, you know, getting your extra sessions or whatever is needed. And it's good that, that that was never came it never came upon us that, you know, that was something we were bad at. I'm pretty sure for all the Irish girls it was it was quite good that we all were able to step into that professional environment. Um, and you know take it in our stride and also like it, it does as Sarah said it does like build you as a person as an athlete as a footballer like it, the, some of the things you learn like you can't even explain it like it's just even that whole mindset um, and preparation like there's so much positives come from it and it is obviously hard as Sarah said like taking players from um, obviously Gaelic football back home but again I just feel like it is showcasing the talent that is there which is good, especially when it's a, a non-professional sport at home. Yeah, big time. And Ashley Maloney, you have been approached before about going out and you made the decision to, to stay home. What were maybe the factors that came into play there that, that decided that decision for you? Um, well, I suppose I'm still in college, so I think for me, getting college on was number one on my priority list. But obviously it's a massive honour and privilege to go over there, so Hopefully at some stage in the future that I will go over there. But for now, I just got to concentrate on finish college, get that done first. Oh uh, yeah, definitely good stuff. And all of you have if, something. If you come over, you should come into uh, Collingwood. I was going to say yeah. there is no doubt that Sarah is going to be pulling <laughs> yeah, you straight. To <laughs> <laughs> I'll be saying well away from no Ireland, that's for sure. Uh, if Ashley McCarthy might have something to say about that, I'd say. <laughs> um, and obviously something you all have in common is you all played together in DCU and you've won the O'Connor Cup together. So that, that's brilliant. I'm sure Ashley and Sheridan has had many fond memories playing together. 
yeah not not even playing together we all live together as well yeah um, that's what that's what i was just thinking when you were talking about ash and sarah being separate i said thank god for ash arrow's purposes because <laughs> none of you know what sarah will be up to <laughs> i'm not gonna tell you that but oh go on ash um, tell us a few things there when you're when you're coming over my head we've been very happy <laughs> so you live together then. So um, who was the the housemate that did all the cleaning, or what was it like? Ashling Maloney, go Ash, on, tell us. Ash Cheryl. Oh, good story. <laughs> the, the other girls don't know how to clean. Like, and I, I'm <laughs> we had a we actually had a story one night. Remember one night we sat down and no one kind of we we always got on with her. Like no one kind of had a go at each other. They're all kind of very laid back and chill. Okay. <laughs> One night, anyway, I got it. Someone was having a go at me for having about 100 packets of tomatoes in the fridge and 20 packets of cheddar cheese. But um, it was actually near the end of the year that we decided to have a go at each other about that. But yeah, and it's actually kind of sad though. Like, leave the yeah. in the sink. And did you it's know each other? It's actually sad when you look back at it though now. So I was nice. even looking at pictures there recently and like, you know, how time has moved on now and the girls in Australia. I'm stuck in college. For a reason, because someone's on this call, <laughs> Cyril. <Sarah. laughs> I'm still in college. How is, how I is it my fault? You, <laughs> you need to accept responsibility for your own actions, Miss Mary. Every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, coppers and rhymes. <laughs> Plagued to go out. <laughs> not true. Not true. Not true. How did you just keep up all the out. county football and everything else and you just run coppers every other night? <laughs> Sarah, yeah. uh, Sarah, Sarah was the going out person. She initiated. No, and I know we only had we had a good bit of crack when we off season. That was the off season. To be fair, after Christmas, like fair once enough. football started, like we all just completely settled down. But we would, um, yeah, we would did have a good bit of crack now. But you have to do that in college, all the same. We've great yeah. stories to tell. Yeah. A robber and all. Well, actually, and fond um, memories. Speaking on uh, teammates, Sarah, um, you're not going to like this one now. I read an interview during the week of one of your teammates from Collingwood, <laughs> Ruby Slider, <laughs> and she said well, she was Ruby. asked. She was asked who the coach's pet was and why, and she said, Sarah Rowe, she's a sweet talker, can talk herself out of anything. All the girls will back me on this. She's a smiling assassin, but she's actually the devil. <laughs> Ashton Sheridan, what do you think of this? Uh, what do you think, Ash? I think that's... Ash, she goes up and, you know, bats the eyelids or the eyelashes and, you know, a little giggle here and there, and off she goes, like, 100%. 100%. Everyone, everyone thinks Sarah's a princess, but like we can actually vow that she 100 percent is complete opposite to that. <laughs> Brilliant, it's, guys! It's called having a personality. <laughs> <laughs> My God! Right, we'll go on to the the 2020 seasons. <laughs> so obviously, looking back for all of you, Sarah from AO, obviously you'd, you'd love to be involved this time of year, no doubt. But looking back, what way do you think it went from AO? How would you sum up the year? Oh, very, very disappointing. I think mm -hmm. that um, we expect a lot more from ourselves and I think we just really underperformed all over the field um, against our man. Now, not to take credit from our man because they had an absolutely outstanding game that day and we just really didn't show up as a team. We were a group of individuals. So I think, I don't know, I don't, you, you always try to pinpoint it to something, but like, you know, you could pick apart the whole thing you could pick apart the whole week and say that you know maybe we weren't prepared maybe individuals weren't prepared i don't know but i just don't i think we fell short and i would expect a lot more from us so it was very disappointing to go out the way we did and um, but at the same time i think that the two best teams are in the final and um, i do believe that and i think that it will be a really good game and i think it will also be a different type of game because it's you know it's winter football i think it'll suit cork that way and um, you know they're a very physical team and they will slow down the play a lot more and i think that um you know they have a real chance as well but obviously dublin's experience and you know being in these situations so many times and um, they will obviously be huge contenders as well but i think it'll be a very interesting game yeah definitely and on your own season you had a, a huge game against Tyrone. You know, you got 2 9 yourself that day, not too bad. And then obviously up against Armagh. And did you think Armagh were going to be as good as they were? Yeah, like we knew they were going to be good, but it, I suppose sometimes, um, 
I don't know, probably a small bit of complacency crept in, definitely. Um, but I I think they were a lot better than we probably expected them to be, yeah. Because we played them before in challenge games and stuff and, you know, the like the score was probably a small bit different. So um but I think like, you know, when they have ca- like players like Amy Mackin who can just like flip a game on its head like that, you know, you need to give them the respect that they deserve mm-hmm. and Blonde is as well. They've like Carla and Hannah, they have some like outstanding like players, some of the best players in the country. So um, I think when you have players like that, you know, you're always going to be kind of, you know, a small, you you will be thinking, OK, this, this team will be good. Yeah, big time. And it was their first time in that All-Ireland semi-final since 2015. So it is good for ladies football, I suppose, to be seeing a mix and to be seeing new teams come in and competing at the top. Yeah, no, it is. It's great. Like, I, I think that's the thing. Like, you see, like, even Tipperary, like, Every year, mm. every year they're pushing teams to the brink. So you know it's only like a matter of time when they're knocking on the door, knocking on the door, like they're going to get in. So it's the same, you know. There's Galway, there's Tip, there's Mayo, there's Cork, there's Dublin, there's Cavan. There's so many teams that have opportunity there and have so many great players. So I think it's just the standards have risen um, drastically. I think the level of training that you know we're expected to do now is far greater than it was a few years ago it's much more professional you know it's it's not acceptable to not like not be you know training hard not be doing your gym program not be eating well like all the things that you know it's not just the the three or four training sessions a week it's it's a lifestyle so I think a lot of people's lifestyles have changed over the last couple of years and that's and you can see that in the field as well the girls are physically stronger and fitter uh, just on that then, uh, obviously that's tough to do and tough to keep up with when you're working or in college or whatever it is. Is is it all positive, that side of things? Do you enjoy that it's it's more professional in a sense? Yeah, like you don't, as a player, like you want to be playing um, at the highest level. You want to be pushed the hardest that you can be and you want all them things in place so that you can be the best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, it's different in an amateur environment versus a professional because like you're essentially the only thing you have to concentrate on when I'm out here is, is football. Whereas when you're at home, it's that like, say you're living in Dublin, I was teaching in Dublin and then you're driving to, you're finishing school at four o'clock and then driving to Mayo, training the Mayo, and then driving back up and not getting back till 1am 1, 1 in the morning and then getting up the next morning to go to school again or to mm. go to the gym before school. And so it was, I think that side of things, it's it's really taxing on your body and it takes a lot of time. And, you know, no matter what way you look at it, it is like a part-time job as well. So um, I do think I do think at times that can be really physically um, draining on players, both um, physically and mentally. Yeah, it's it's like a full time job. It really is. But I, as you all love it so much that it probably doesn't feel like it's any way like that. But Ashling, well, only for Tipperary then, um, you didn't get any wins in the championship. But it's nearly hard to say that because each game against Galway and Monaghan, it was just one point. So it was just such close margins. I'm sure there's a lot of positives maybe you could take from it. Um. Yeah, I suppose I feel like as a team, we've kind of been going through a transition with the last five mm-hmm. or six years. We've lost girls, new girls have came in. And for us, although it was disappointing, we actually took a lot of positives from it. Probably looking at the Monaghan game, we gave them too much of a lead in the first half. And in the Galway game, we probably could have snapped at the end. But like our eldest player now is Ash McCarthy, who is 23. So looking at that, there's an awful lot of positives going forward. It mightn't happen for us in the next year or two, but hopefully in four or five years' time, we'll be knocking on the door. Um, But yeah, I know we did take a lot of positives from those performances. My God, I never realised that 23 is the oldest player on your team. Yeah, it's mad because even um, even when I joined, I remember I was 17 when I first joined yeah. and within a year or two, I became one of the oldest. And I remember actually saying to one of our younger girls, Caitlin Kennedy this year, I was like, Caitlin, you know, you're one of the older ones now and it's mad in Tipperary because we're so young. There must be about five or six of them girls that was their debut this year playing. So even looking at Ash McCarthy, and she's only a year older than me, and thinking that she's one of the on the team now, just shows that we have great potential going forward. Yeah, and obviously... What about Sa- Sam and Maria Curley? Um, Maria Curley is younger than Ash Mac. Sam is kind oh. of in the way of the side now if she's going to come back or not. So as of now, Ash Mac is the oldest. But it's great. I was just, I suppose... je- just checking your maths. <laughs> you know my maths isn't good. She doesn't let you know um, anything, Ashling. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's weird because I suppose when I started out with Tipperary, my dream was to be playing senior. And to be honest with you, I actually never thought that day would ever come. Um, I actually was just looking after we lost to Monaghan. I was actually just looking at videos. Mom and Dad, they're mad into up and they're just watching videos on YouTube. We were playing Waterford and Wexford four years ago and struggling to go out to Division 3. So suddenly now we're at Division 1 and suddenly we're competing against these teams. But I think you kind of have to just reflect and look back and say, OK, mm-hmm. we actually have come this far. I suppose Shane Renan, who's involved with us in all the management teams down through the years, have actually changed Tipperary football for the better. Sadly, now he's after, after stepping away this year. But it's just you kind of have to stop and think for a minute. We're all on this mad roller coaster, even in terms of probably everything that's going on in ladies football at the minute. Like two years ago, we weren't playing in stadiums and now it's a norm to play in a stadium. So I suppose for us here in Tip, we have a young team. It's about trying to keep them girls playing and hopefully in three or four years time, getting everything right, all the, the basics and foundations right that we could be um, tipping on the door even better, maybe progressing on to all our inside final and hopefully maybe one day bringing the Brandon Martin home. We'll see. Yes, definitely. That's brilliant. I love that. I think if anything this year, we it sort of taught us to celebrate like the small wins. So like you said, if that's playing in Crow Park or getting to a, a Leinster final, an Ulster final, Munster, whatever it is, like those things you should celebrate because then when you do get to one day, hopefully, you know, get to the All-Ireland final and lift the Brenda Martin Cup, that, you know, you'll, you'll nearly celebrate it more because you celebrate all your small wins, if that makes sense. But no, that's a brilliant way to look at it. Um, and obviously, yeah. Ashing, for you, you, you scored 1-7 against Monaghan, one ten against Galway. You must look back and think you had a good year yourself. Um, well, I kind of, to be honest, don't tend to do that because now if I was doing running or something, I'd probably take all the credit. But <laughs> like, it's, it is a team sport at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're all kind of rolling in together and we all have the one ambition to win at the end of the day. So as I say, it's easy for me up front. I never, as the girls would know, I don't go past the halfway line. <clears> so all the work is done up throughout the field, I suppose, you know, and the last thing I have to do is just try to put it between the poles. So, you know, I have to thank everyone around you as well for everything that they're doing. I suppose they probably just make it easier for us up front in the forwards, the backs. I always say a back will never get enough credit. The forward will always get looked at. And it's actually the backs who go unknown to everyone. So, yeah, look, it was a great year personally, I suppose. Um, you know, trying out new things, probably with Camogie and stuff as well. It was a personal challenge. Um, it was actually a very weird one. I remember going training every time and I was like, what am I doing to myself? Why am I doing this? Because I was in an environment where I had to ask the person, what's your name? Where are you from? Like, because it's all in our tip girls. So yeah. it was a massive personal challenge for me. But I remember coming out after every training session, like, geez, I actually feel great about myself. I'm probably setting myself into a position where I'm not comfortable. And then, you know, after training and probably doing something small in training, that my, I might do in football, I wouldn't get satisfaction. But doing it in Camogie or something, I get severe, I get such satisfaction from it. And I suppose new voices, new management team, different girls and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, look, I suppose we'll look forward now to 2021 and we're going to have a new management team in place. All that's going to be new to us as well. So I suppose what we'll try to do now as the girls are away, Ashing and Orla, I suppose we can kind of try to keep our status at Division 1 and try to hold it up there. So that'll probably be our main aim now going into 2021. Yeah, and I am just on the the dual um, code. So you played both camogie and football this year. It was the first time you did it. What made that decision for you? Was it that we had a shorter season this year? And do you think it'll be something you'll keep on for next year? I actually, I always wanted to do it. For years, I've been saying, OK, this year I mightn't play football and I'll just give camogie a go because I know that, you know, the, the effort that it takes to play the two and the toll it has in the body. Mm-hmm. But um, I suppose the way the year fell this year and my dad is a massive... Um, hurling person as well and camogie person so I kind of always wanted to do it for him but um, I suppose what made up my mind was the way the season worked and I wasn't in Dublin I didn't have to commute from home from college I was at home getting mommy's meals served up to me and stuff like that so it kind of made it a lot easier to do it Um, I suppose when I started it maybe the first two weeks or three weeks I did find it hectic on the body but I suppose it becomes mind over matter then after a Mm -hmm. while and I just put the head down and get on with it. And it actually worked out fine, to be honest. There was no issues there. Management were very understanding on both sides. And, you know, if you're, a tri- if you're retired normally before, I wouldn't say it, I'd train on. But, you know, at the end of the day, you kind of have to look after yourself. So um, I kind of learned that aspect of it as well. But, yeah, no, it was... I remember even the debut against Claire. It was very yeah. weird. I hadn't a clue where I was going on the pitch. The tactics are totally different. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I remember it, it's just gas because it puts you in the position because maybe some football younger girls might feel the same. Do you know, if you're explaining something, they kind of don't get it. But I actually was put in that position then and I was standing in the middle field during the game and like, where am I even going here? Like, I didn't know <laughs> the ball is just passing over my head. But um, yeah, no, it was all it was all a challenge, but I'm definitely going to do the two now going into next year to give it a crack. Brilliant, yeah, exactly. It was all a challenge and you learn probably loads from it too. And Ashling, obviously, Sheridan, you've had a tough group. You've had Cork and Kerry. Um, what was it like playing against Cork? What impressed you, I suppose, about them? Um, I just thought their physicality, like, we've been knocking around Division 2 for so many years, getting to finals and just not being successful. And then you come out and play a championship and you play senior teams. And every year we say it, that physical aspect um, that that's brought in the senior teams that you don't get in Division 2. Um, it's really hard to get used to. So that's, I suppose, where it's very good having an Ulster Championship as well to kind of prepare you for that because that would be that kind of physical side. Um, but, yeah, I, I really thought that was brilliant about Cork. And um, they're just, they're, they're football smarts um, and their work rate. Like, you know, it's very impressive. And look at it, it was a tough group. And... But that's what you want. Like, if you want to be competing at the best, you have to play the best. Um, mm -hmm. Whether you want an easy run of it or not. Um, so I know a few people are probably thrown off uh, when they've seen our group. But look, at to me, I take that challenge and think, well, like, that's what you want. And look, at if you lose, you lose. But at least you learn something from the game. And they're probably the best games to learn things. Be able to reflect and see where can you get better and how can you reach that standard. Yeah, and um, they obviously are scoring big scores over three games. I think they got ten forty, like that. That's madness. I'm yeah. sure that was something tough to have to deal with. Yeah, de yeah, it definitely was. Um, like to be fair, I remember at half time, like I don't think we were down by much, and mm. I think we were shocked ourselves because we went out with the mentality that, um, like we've nothing to lose here. Um, obviously we would lost to Kerry the week before, and I think especially after having a really tough year, losing girls and um, missing trainings with COVID. We got, Calvin got hit quite bad with it. So we had to take a few breaks in, in between when we were supposed to be back training, which again, like you're after having a full summer off and then because we got hit really bad, then you were taking another two to three weeks off group training. So you're back doing your own thing. And um, you would miss that. And then I just think, you know, obviously then there was, a lot of mistakes made then in the second half, which is where you need to tidy up. You know, you can't just be coming out and playing one half of football. Um, but yeah, then the goals start to come in. And I think even what we learned in the first half is to actually just back your own ability and forget about the outside noise and who you're playing. And they have this player and that player and stuff. And, you know, you have to learn to back yourself. And I think that's something we really need to work on and um, develop, especially leading in. As we have some new girls playing with us this year, you know, girls who haven't even played minor football, minor county, and um, we're starting that day. So mm -hmm. it was a big step up for them as well, to, you know, to be marking someone on a Cork team that has probably won a few All-Irelands or All-Stars. Um, but look, that's what you want, and it helps develop the whole team, which is good. Yeah, definitely. And as you said, you're having those younger girls come in, and you'll build on that yeah. each year, and it, it's it's only a positive. We have a clip yeah. here of the, the Cork captain, Darren O'Sullivan, on how they have to embrace the challenge of stopping the Dubs getting that four in a row. Have a listen. When I first started with Cork, we were um, the team to beat, I suppose. We were the ones going for the, the four in a row. Um, and just so quickly now, Dublin have turned it around and they're now the team to beat. Um, and look, it is a huge challenge. Um, they're a, a hugely successful team. Um, they're a formidable outfit. Um, but we do believe um, we can beat them. I suppose there's no point... Um, training at the start of the year or meeting in January if you don't think you can be the best. So um, we are we are positive um, about the challenge ahead. Um, I think a lot of it um, is just about doing the simple things right. Um, I think last year in the semi-final and the year previous uh, in the final, we actually panicked a small bit um, and then start, say Dublin got a goal and we hit the panic button very early on. Um, so I think it will be important, especially in the first 10 minutes, to just do the simple simple thing right. Um, we have a very young team. Um, I think we have three or four girls in their late 20s. And besides that, we have a lot of students. Um, so I think especially um, in the opening 15 minutes before the first water break, if we're level with Dublin or a point or two down, we'll be, we'll be happy with that. 
Yeah, Darren O'Sullivan, the core captain there, she mentioned that last year and the previous year they they panicked a small bit. Um, Ashim Sheridan, do you think maybe having no crowd this year will take maybe some of that pressure and panic away? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's it's obviously strange playing with no crowd, but I feel like Cork just needs to go out with the mentality that, you know, they're there for a reason. As Sarah said, you know, I, I definitely think they're the two best teams to be in the mm -hmm. final. Um, from playing Cork, I definitely highly rate them. I just feel like, I feel like it could be their year. Um, but yeah, they definitely just need to go in. They have nothing to lose. Um, obviously, Dublin are uh, hoping to retain their title. So, look at it. Then I always think of football as it's fifteen against fifteen, and um, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to just take out the extra things that go on and just go out and do what you know what to do. And it's, it's sometimes it's just as simple as that. Yeah, definitely. And. Sarah, they have a very young team uh, coming through, you know, so maybe some of the older girls, you know, the Raina Buckley's, Breach Corky, all those girls have, have moved on and we see these younger crop of girls coming in that are doing just as good a job. It, it's brilliant to see, really. Yeah, they're definitely breeding a lot of players down there. Mm -hmm. And like, you look at the likes of Sarah Shanoonan and how much of an impact she's had this year. And there's that kind of, you know, they don't really have as much fear, I suppose, or is the, the older players, you know, they know what it feels like. They know the hurt of losing All-Ireland Finals and they also know how to win All-Ireland Finals. So they can they can feel both. So it's, you know, you would definitely be, the, the older you get, the probably more significant it feels for you. And the more you're like, these opportunities don't come around that often. And when they come, you need to grab them. Whereas younger players just kind of, you know, this is yeah. great now we're playing in Crow Park and they're delighted. So it's um, even one of the younger girls on our team, Sierra Shalali, like last year, I remember her like looking around being in Crow Park and she was like, this is just like, this is just class to be here, she said. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I looked at her and just thought, I was like, that is just, is the cutest thing ever. But it was just like the way she was like, just so happy to be there versus when like we were all thinking about the game kind of thing and yeah. she she just talked out that day but I was thinking I was like younger players just see the kind of experience of it all really and they're just taking it all in and it's great it's so refreshing to have that kind of um blood in in, in a group and um, I think that like Darren spoke really well there and I think like her I suppose her lead their leadership those Sullivan's in general their leadership on the field combined with Orla Finn and Searsha and all these younger players as well like you know I do think they're a serious force and as I said that they're very physical and they they do also know how to win all Ireland finals while Dublin have the experience the last few years like you know they've been put in that, that position numerous times and I believe there's enough um of a balance between the kind of the youth and the I suppose old so um yeah I I've I've a good feeling for Cork and just speaking on Dublin there yeah um, you've obviously played against them many times you played them in the 2017 all Ireland final something I think that impresses me about them is their running game something the McMowan has uh, seemed to hammer home, you know, that they, they they turn over the ball and they all break at pace and they're like have diagonal runs, there's support on each side. It would be quite, I can only imagine, hard to play against. What maybe impresses you about them um, that will really stand to them now come Sunday? Yeah, I think their physical um, fitness, um, mm -hmm. I suppose, I think you can see that they have a lot of gym work done and they're physically strong and their running ability and endurance is, um, you know, it is elite. And I think that like they have a certain structure in their forward line that it's really hard to mark. And it is for backs, they get really confused as to who they're meant to be yeah. on because they're always switching all the time. I think someone like Nicole Owens coming back into that setup as well is huge for them because she creates a lot of that herself and Carla Rowe, you know, there's a lot of diagonal running going on there that causes confusion that then gives Sinead Ahern the space that she needs for, that she can do, I suppose, the damage. So when you combine that all together and they have players on the bench who, you know, essentially would start on any other team as well. So they have that kind of, you know, they have that freshness to come on the last 20 minutes as well. So I think definitely their running game and the style of play that they play. Um, I think Mick is a very smart coach. I think he knows how to set up against the opposition. I think he knows... Um, you know who to put on who so i think that'll be really interesting to see the matchups like who you know who's going to take orla finn and mm -hmm. um, you know she's time and time again performs and probably like you know if you look at any of all the i have rarely seen orla finn play bad so yeah. i don't know who's going to mark her and um i think searsha and like there's also they've great defenders as well they have um players who can mark some of their key forwards as well 
Yeah, just speaking on Orla Finn, she's someone that you'd love to have as your free taker. She never seems to miss. And I think on those occasions where there is pressure and you're in Pro Park, it's All-Ireland Final, to have someone maybe like her that, you know, doesn't let it get to her and she just steps up and pops them over. It's definitely important to have. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Go on ahead, sorry. Oh, so she goes so un underrated, though, I feel, Orla Finn. She yeah, never really gets I the agree. credit that she deserves. But a lot of them Cork mm. girls actually don't get the credit they, they deserve. I think Melissa Duggan for me, if I was to fear someone in the world, uh, I, class. the sight of Melissa Duggan coming near me, I'd run another way. Um, <laughs> so I think a lot of them, a lot of them actually, me and Sarah actually spoke about that before. Um, yeah. But a lot of them do actually go under the radar um, since they've kind of dwindled down from in all Ireland's But I think there's, they're a force we reckon with really in all Ireland final. I think they'll really pull up them too. Why do you think that is? Is it because they've just been so dominant over the years and they've had so many well-known players well, I feel like they've a, they've, a, they've a great mix of youth and experience and I mm. feel like the last two years um they probably have unfinished business and probably you know that bit of upset going into all and final I just feel this year in particular given the year it is I just some I just know there's something in me that feels that like they have that upper hand over over Dublin this year um I think they're kind of they've less fear in them they look like they're playing with less fear and even the way they're playing this year this year and the way if has them set up I feel like they're more attacking and It'll be an interesting yeah. one, but I think that I think that they will. They're they're going to do it. I feel like they will. They're very good at getting everyone behind the ball. Like I noticed that when I was in the forward line. Like mm -hmm. if we had the ball coming in, like they had like Orla Finn was down winning some of their kickouts and her up in the forward My line. God. Like they're very good at getting back, but they're also very good at getting up the field as well. Like they have that physical fitness. Now I know Dublin is very good at that as well. Like both teams, I suppose would have to probably watch that because they're both very good at attacking and getting back. But you know. If both are good at it, like there could be a slip up somewhere. But um, I have to say, I noticed that against Cork, their ability to, if we had the ball coming towards our forward line, their ability to get players behind that ball and slow it up was just phenomenal. Yeah, I think though, even if you listen to Darren there and the way she spoke as well about like how they you know there's a real sense of we've learned from our mistakes before mm. and we're not going to do it again kind of thing when she's saying just go back to basics and go back to the simple things like it's like as if they you know they really are ready for this challenge without being cocky it's like you know it's kind yeah. of humbling listening to it and it's kind of i fa felt a sense of they're ready when i listened to her speak when you just played it a minute ago so i i think they obviously the messaging that's going out from them as well is really positive because sometimes you know before a game if a team's going to win or not by things that you see. Sometimes you can see things in the paper or you can see someone spoke some way and you can nearly feel that energy and I just feel good energy from that. Yeah, definitely. And something about Dublin this year, I know they haven't had as many games, but they haven't put up the scores like they have other years. And we've seen against Armagh, they had a tough game. They, I don't know, were they a bit vulnerable against Armagh maybe? Are they as strong as they were last year or are they ready to peak? What do you think, Ashling Maloney? Um, yeah, even looking at the game, I suppose, Armagh did set up very well and I suppose they mm. actually did really break down Dublin in ways that probably our teams couldn't. Um, but I suppose in terms of Dublin, they do have a lot of older girls there, like Sinead Hearn and Lindsay Davey. And I suppose coming from Cork's point of view, they have a lot of younger girls coming up along. They always kind of seem to have that conveyor belt of youth coming in and mixed with experience. But... When those older girls um, start to dwindle out with Dublin, it'll be interesting to see um, what younger ones are going to come up through the ranks. But in terms of Armagh um, opening them up, I suppose Dublin are going to learn from that. You know, they're not going to let that happen again and they're going to do whatever needs to be done to stop that from happening. Because um, at the end of the day, as they say, goals win games. And I suppose they probably got surprised with how Armagh got in so many times. So I suppose. There's like AMAC and you know, how do you stop her? Do you put the do you put the whole team on her? What do you do to try to stop her as well? So like they were up against it, but no, I feel like I feel like they are gonna have their homework done. Um, two sides are gonna, but it'll be interesting. Probably with Cork, I feel like they just have that bit more experience up front in terms of breaking down Dublin's back. So coming from our mass point of view, I heard Amy spoken, she said that they have a lot of youth in their team as well. So I feel like the experience Cork are probably the best team to challenge them um, for the All-Ireland. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be a brilliant game. Dublin captain Sinead Ahern, she missed a lot of the semi-final win against Armagh with a hamstring injury. Um, here's what she had to say on watching the game from the sideline and the challenge that Cork will be this weekend. Yeah, I, I suppose it was a, it was cut short, as you say. Um, I think 
you know, particularly in the in the first half, we, we probably weren't happy with some of our forward plays. So um, you know, we had to we had to tighten it up a lot in the in the second half. And you know, the girls really came out and um, you know, were, were much more accurate and, and more clinical and controlled in what they did. So um, yeah, I think it was pleasing to to be challenged in that way and, and to be able to have uh, to have come back. You know, we we know a lot about Cork, I suppose. Um, over the years, we played them a, a, a number of times and. Um, you know they're they're a fast team, they're an attacking team, um, but they defend very well. And I don't expect anything, you know, too too drastically different um, on the day from you know from from what they've been putting into practice throughout the, the rest of their games this season. So look, we'll see. Obviously, um, you know, we'll need to be prepared for for whatever happens in the day. But you know, we'll, through our own preparation, um, you know, we expect to be able to be able to whatever gets thrown at us. Yeah, Dublin captain Sinead Hearn there, very much aware of the challenge that Cork is going to bring. Just on Sinead Ahern, Sarah, um, she did suffer the hamstring injury. She has been back training um, and she says it's she, she's doing well. What sort of impact would it be on the team if maybe that became an issue in the final? Oh, she would be an absolute huge blow mm. if she wasn't playing. I, I really believe that, like, that she has so much smarts and so much brains um, behind that forward line um, is in Sinead Hearn for sure like there's obviously great runners and everything and they create a lot of space for her um, but ultimately like she just does the simple things really well and she's clearly a really good leader as well and she's been there for years and people definitely look to her you can see that people look to her to step up when you know when the pressure is on and, and she does it time and time again so I think it would be an absolute huge blow to Dublin if um, Sinead Hearn couldn't play for some reason or if you know she pulled up through, throughout the game so um, fingers crossed for her because you, you'd hate to see a player like her um, sit out for an All-Ireland final you know Cork want to play the best and um, in doing that, Sinead Hearn needs to be on the field. Yeah, definitely. We do wish her well and hope that uh, it'll all go right for her. If you have just tuned in, you're very welcome to the little preview of the All-Ireland Ladies Football Final. Little proudly supporting Ladies Gaelic Football. Hashtag serious support. I am joined by Ashling Sheridan from Cavan, Sarah Rose Mayo and Ashling Maloney from Tipperary. So we're going to move on now to the, the chaos that was the All-Ireland semi-final. Um, it was... Cork and Galway, we've seen that there was three venue changes and then as a result it was moved to Crow Park at last minute and Galway didn't get enough time to warm up um, and also then the coverage, it, w it wasn't shown or wasn't televised um, and that was a huge blow to, to family and friends. And I know you don't want to be um, going on talking about it but I think it's important we do talk about it just to always sort of highlight it and hope that there is change that will come of it. Ashling Maloney, what was your first reaction when you heard of the changes? Um, I suppose I'm smiling because, you know, controversy again, but um, mm. I seem to always, if people say me, I seem to always talk in the middle of it, but um, yeah, no, it just, to be honest, just kind of unnecessary negative publicity that probably could have been avoided. I suppose at the end of the day, there was just a lot of negative publicity around on social media and stuff like that. And, I suppose with ladies football doing so well and with them with little and stuff and teaching her on board, John, mm -hmm. it's going an upper curve and just for that to happen, I suppose it did kind of just put it push it back that step. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, there's a lesson learned that it won't happen again because I suppose the more of these things happen, the more negative um, kind of buzz goes around the place. But I suppose it probably could have been avoided if you're calling a spade a spade. Um, it should have been sorted two weeks before the match, I suppose players are putting in so much time and effort throughout the year and even for families and parents for, they give up an awful lot too um, to enable us to play so for them not being able to watch it was obviously very sad as well I know my two at home they'd nearly be crying if they couldn't see it being streamed as well I suppose but that's that's probably the streaming probably was a bit of a little thing but for the players to be rushed before a game and all that kind of um, side of things that was probably just very negative and I can only imagine myself before a game as well having to rush into an honour in semi-final um, but look hopefully lessons are learned and the fact that it was publicised and everyone is covering it it just shows that ladies football is on the up and it's mm. there to be criticised and it's great that it is being criticised because that's what we all want but look just as I said hope lessons are learned and it won't happen again yeah definitely and Ashing Sheridan when we heard that Galway didn't have enough time to warm up and they got on the pitch and we spoke with the Galway manager and he said that you know, they, they were sort of telling him, come on, you only have six, seven minutes. He says he regrets it, that he didn't walk that day. Do you think that they should have? 
Yeah, I just think they were very unfair to not let them have enough time, like seven minutes to do a warm up, never mind stretching. Like mm. you would only be halfway through high knees. Like you wouldn't be like speaking from before you even get your hands on the ball, before you even do all the simple things like it's it's awful to only have seven minutes. And I know then they were like, oh, they might have spent too much time in the change room and all. But I know from our experience, like especially with everything that was going on, the time was so rigid. Like you had to have everything done. You had to have your band work done. Like, you know, it's not as simple as going into the change room, throwing on a pair of shorts, off you go. Like, especially females and stuff. Like it does take a little bit more time. You do your band work. If people have extra prehab to do something like that. And then to get onto the pitch and you have seven minutes, like, I know myself, I would have been very um, unsettled. I suppose hindsight is a great thing. Um, you know, at the time, you don't think of, okay, we walk the pitch. At the time, you're thinking, okay, this is an Ireland semi-final. It's, it's just what's going to ha- happen. And then you look back and, you know, ifs and buts and we should have done this. And, like, it's, it's awful to be in that position to think, you know, it's like to be that team, to be Galway and to experience that. Um, but, like, you know, only having seven minutes, like something else should have been done, like... Like seven minutes, if they'd even got 15 or 20, it mm. would have been better. But, you know, I don't know. It's just a tricky one. This is it. If it even they could have pushed the, the men's semi final out a small bit or just to give them that bit of time because they traveled from Galway. Some of the girls were three hours. You know, even just mm. how to get on a pitch and you could pull your hamstring straight away if, you, if you're not warmed up properly. So there's all those factors. Sarah, what was your view on it all? Um, to be honest, when I saw it first, like I couldn't really believe that that had happened, mm-hmm. and um, I just think that like players are very set in their routine. Like I know Rachel Cairns, for instance, on, on my team with Mayo. Like if she doesn't have the same coffee on a like a day of a game, or if she hasn't, like she used to have the superstition that she used to have to see me the night before a game, and we used to have to have dinner together. So like <laughs> certain players can be really particular about certain things, mm-hmm. and when something like that is thrown off, it throws people off completely mentally as well. So like they're going into that game being like you know like straight away you're like oh we're on the back foot here this is only going one way and then you know you're thinking that way so that's ultimately what's going to happen so I think mentally that would have a huge impact on the players and you would have been trying to tell yourself adapt 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 change you know we need to be able to adapt you would have been trying to tell yourself then things but ultimately it would have been really um filtering in in their mind so I'm so very surprised that that happened and I think it was a slip up by um ladies football and I think that you know in these situations like there's nothing right about the situation. You just have to put your hands up and say, we made a mistake, that's on us, our mistake, our bad, and move on with it. And, like, you know, if you do that, then I think, you know, it is what it is. It's that's it's the business that. decision that didn't go right. Um, and so I think you kind of just need to be objective about the whole thing and be like, right, we messed up there. And I think, you know, you move, you learn, everyone makes mistakes. But at the same time, I think to kind of say that Galway you know, where it took too long in the change room, like, you can't say that. And especially, like, if you look at any team, like, I'm sure your team, like, there's strappings to be done. Mm -hmm. There's rubs to be done. There could have been a player being like, oh, I usually get my my hamstring rubbed, but, like, I have only two minutes in the game and we're on to the field, like, I'm just going to have to skip it. Like, there's so much more things than just throwing on your shorts, your socks, and off you go like especially physio if there's only one physio and there could be five girls and if you're strapping ankles whatever it may be Mm -hmm. like that takes time never mind then rubs or whatever else it might be so i just yeah i suppose with the with the men's game as well asking to put it forward i suppose if go park would have been gotten in a split second kind of could it not have been on there in the first place as well so i suppose it's easier for us to ponder here and you know, ask questions and stuff, but it is important that it is highlighted. And as Sarah said, you know, you know, admit your mistake. As Sarah said again, you know, what the count probably wasn't really good enough. Um, it should have been avoided. And if Coke Park would have been gotten like that, it probably just should have been on there because you kind of have to respect the GA, you know, it's their ground, separate organizations and all that. And that probably leads into, you know, is it time for them to come on, come in on under the one? But I suppose having the men's to put their games for probably isn't fair, really. Probably if the LG, LGFA just had their their groundwork done and had it on Crow Park mm-hmm. in the first place, Joey wouldn't be sitting here having this debate. But it's good that we're having this debate and hopefully that the lessons are learned from it. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and just on that, the we've seen then this week the WGPA and the GPA have decided to come together in one player's body, um, all under the one roof as such. So that's something positive that's came maybe off the back of, of this, you know, and we could look at it that way. Ashling Maloney, would you have been in favour of the, the two organisations coming as one? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, obviously, if you have more people behind pushing the wheel, the wheel is going to move faster. So mm -hmm. 4,000 members under the one umbrella now and with different surveys and all that that's going on, I suppose the more voice you have under the one umbrella, um, the more effective it's going to be. So when I saw it, I was actually in complete another shock, shock when I saw it, to be honest. I thought I'd never see that happen, but fair play to everyone who's involved in the executives and everyone that has made it happen. Um, and it's a great move, um, a great step forward in the right direction. And, you know, it can only lead to better things, better and bigger things. And do you think it'll help maybe with, like, support structures or facilities, things like that? And now it is just one GPA that it might just, I don't know, something that always strikes me maybe about the, the lady footballers is that the expense of, like, going to and forth to games, to trainings is it's colossal. I don't know, Sarah, what it's like for you, but it's it just seems like it's a lot. And some girls are they're in college or school and, you know, it's probably their parents that are footing the bill then. Do you think maybe with these sort of things we might see improvements on those side of things? Yeah, 100%. Like, as a ladies footballer, you'd be at a loss um, trying mm. to play for your county because, you know, with expenses and driving up and down and all that kind of stuff, like, you definitely would be at a loss. Um, but I think, yeah, once it's under the one roof, it means that, like, you know, what one team gets, the other team gets, and so on and so forth. And they don't, I suppose, in this situation now, there won't be distinguishing between the men's and the women's. It would just be, you know, we're all one. And, you know, more sport is good. And us all together is, you know, one organisation. So it's to not kind of distinguish between males and females it would just be all the one so if men i would expect if men are getting such an amount of expenses from the gpa the women will get the exact same because that's the way it, you would think it would happen now so um i like to think that that's the way and um, it will unfold and if it is that's absolutely amazing and ashling sheridan do you think that hopefully soon we will all be under the one umbrella would you like to see that as just the ga yeah, it'd be interesting to see, um, you know, obviously there's people in favour for it and people obviously not, but I think it could it could ha have a massive impact on uh, ladies' Gaelic football. Like, you see the issues that we just previously talked about, like, if we, if we were under the one umbrella, um, would that happen? Um, I'd love to know why what's stopping us from merging. Um, mm -hmm. But I suppose, like everyone, you probably want to know maybe a little bit more detail, the ins and outs, would it actually negatively affect the LGFA or what kind of would be the outline of what could they see or what would be proposed in the future and that if we did join under the one umbrella, you know, what benefits would we get? Because again, you kind of just don't want to go in and not know much about it all the same. So it'd be interesting. I definitely would love to see it be, you know, discussed more and, you know, obviously put forward a lot more. I think in recent times, probably in the last few months, it has been. Um, so I'd say probably in the next year, um, there'll definitely be, I'd say, a lot more talk about it and maybe a little bit more action as well. Yeah, definitely. I don't think it's the last we're going to hear about it now. The intermediate final is Mead versus Westmead um, on at the weekend as well. It's at 1.15 on Sunday. So Mead are trying to make it third time lucky. Uh, they lost the last two All-Irelands. Ashling Maloney, you know all about that one. Um, you played against them last year. What do you make of Mead? What sort of team are they? Um, well, first of all, I think intermediate division in particular is it kind of goes it kind of does go under the radar. Um, it's mm. a severely hard competition to get out of. We've been there twice and we've struggled to get through there, meeting Clare, meeting Mead, Ross Common, all these teams. Um, but for Mead, I think that they were unlucky last even last year with us, I suppose. They're unlucky at times. We probably got a goal in them that set us up then for the rest of the game. Ash McCarthy's goal in the second half that helped mm. us push on. But for me in particular, um, I kind of, for myself, I admire them. Um, I know a good few of the players. I kind of hope that they do it because they're such a good team and they have a young team and they have great steps to move forward. And I suppose if they end up getting a loss again on Sunday, um, it will only be, might be negative for them. So... Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a tough one though. Westmead are very good as well. Um, 
playing them in league and stuff like that. They're a very tough side, so it'll be an interesting one. But I suppose playing me and knowing the girls and the ins and outs from the last number of years and the, the battles we've had, I kind of would be a number one fan for hoping that Mead would win. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're a great team. They really have stuck together over the last number of years. You know, it's the same core group that have stayed together. Um, so, yeah, they'll definitely be hoping to get over the line. And Westmead, we've seen they, they came down from senior, um, hoping that they'll get back up and we see they're in the final, you know, because it could be possible. Ashing Sheridan, is there, I don't know, we see, we've seen it with Tipperary, they came down, went back up, came down. What is there a big, a big gap there between the senior and intermediate? Um, there definitely is. Well, I'd find that as well because we'd probably be playing more intermediate teams. Mm -hmm. There would be that intermediate team, I suppose, in um, Division Two, and that's where we'd meet Mead, and we'd often even play Mead in challenge games. And I'd highly rate them. I think, you know, they've been very unlucky, and I do see them doing it this year. But then I look at West Mead, and I feel like they have a lot more experience. I feel mm -hmm. like they have a lot more older players and um, you know you look at the likes of John and Maher like people like that that could actually maybe push them across the line and um, you know so it's nearly like experience versus you know older players and um, versus like I suppose younger players but again they have been in this situation like Mead it's their third time so like they're not going to want to leave without the win um, so I definitely think it'll be very close and obviously because the two teams are quite close to each other like I'm sure everyone knows you don't like playing your neighbour and team like mm -hmm. no Cavan versus Monaghan uh, Mayo versus Galway whoever it may be um, it could be a situation like that as well that you never know what way the result could go do you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. so yeah it's interesting it's going to be another close one well we're at the time yeah. now prediction time so I'm going to come to each of you and you can give me your prediction for the intermediate and the senior and you can let me know if you think it's going to be close or one or two points in it or if someone's going to win well you can let me know that too so Sarah I'll come to you first so we'll start with the intermediate between Westmead and Mead who do you think will take it? Westmead Will it be close? Um, it will be close. I'd say, I reckon, maybe by three points. Oh. And Ashton Maloney, who do you think in the intermediate? Um, I'm going to have to say Mead. And will they win it by well? By three points. Okay. And Ashton so, Sheridan? Coffee cat. <laughs> um, I think Mead by four. Right. Very good. Mix there. So we want you would always so. just go against what I say, really. <laughs> yeah, of course. You have the moral of the story here. <laughs> and then we'll move on then to the seniors. So, Sarah, we'll go with you again. Um, who I'll sit again, not Cheryl. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go definitely, uh, well, not definitely, but I'm going to go with Cork um, by two. Right, good stuff. And Ash Maloney? Cork by two. Very good. Cork by a point. Cork by a point, was it, Ash? Yeah. Jeez, right. So all of his cork, that's a turn of the books there. Good stuff. Um, yeah, brilliant. Right, so I um, won't keep you too much longer, but just something I wanted to ask you is to finish on then. The year that we've had, it's been a mad year. It's a lot of changes for everyone, and obviously in work, sport, and everything else. Is there anything that you'll take from this year? As the girls are in quarantine there, you've got to reflect a lot, I'm sure. Is there anything that maybe is either a put things in perspective or is there anything that you think going forward next year I mightn't take things as serious or whatever it is? Do you have anything yourselves? Sarah Rowe, I'll come to you first. Um, there's lots, lots of things that could be learned from this year. I think um, firstly, it's to, I suppose, the, the people around you and um, your family obviously is number one, but sometimes we get caught up in a world of our own that we have so much things going on that we you know forget to sometimes spend loads of time with them i think having that time with them over the last couple of months has been great i also think it's taught me that and um, how important it is to have a life and have other things outside of sport as well and i always have had that i've always created habits around my life that allowed me to have you know a social life and have sport mm -hmm. and have all these other different but it, it became really apparent to me that that is extremely important and also to think about um, future Sarah and what she wants to do and all that kind of stuff and not just be so I suppose tunnel vision about sports because sometimes you can get so caught up in yourself and your own routine and all these things and I think it, it 
taught me a lot about how to adapt and change um, quicker. Yeah, definitely well said. And Ashley Maloney, what about for you? Um, I think it says we're all on a massive conveyor belt there the last number of years, constantly on the go on to the next thing. And I suppose it kind of made us all stop and actually think and appreciate everything that's gone around us. And I suppose everyone was traveling all over Ireland as well. And, you know, people are actually appreciating what's around them now and the little mm -hmm. things like Sarah said, your family and your friends. And I suppose once everyone's healthy and happy, they're the most important things to you. But I suppose going into 2021, 20, um, you know, it has been mentally challenging for everyone, I suppose. People's businesses are gone. People have lost loved ones who haven't been at funerals. I've been at a few myself. I suppose my parents' business is gone. So it has been a massive challenge. And I think that if we survive this year, we can survive anything um, because I think it has tested us in so many different ways. But um, going into next year, I suppose, just appreciating the little things around you, even for this Christmas, you know, mm -hmm. it's not all about, you know, going out, socializing, I suppose, sitting at home and just having a conversation and put the phone away with people around you and appreciating that they're there with you. Um, is probably the number one list for me. Yeah, it, it is. It sort of made us all realise a small bit, I think. And yeah, something we'll definitely take going into the new year. And Ashing, uh, Sheridan, for you. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, for me, it was appreciating the things around me. Um, I'm, I was very lucky. I came home and I was surrounded by my family. And I have three older sisters and my parents. And obviously, when we were in lockdown, there wasn't much we could do. But I actually did things with my sisters that we haven't done since we were children. Like we were fully acting as if we were children and doing things like that we hadn't done. And it's memories like that that I look back and I'm like, I'm so glad to have them and that we were all together. And it just made me really appreciate the small things, you know, having extra family dinners because we're all in the house together and we'd always be scattered around the place. And then another thing I also found was to not take anything for granted and um, you know it's the simple thing of going to meet your friends or going somewhere or meeting a loved one or something like that like you know we, i think we always took that for granted and we were just going here there and yonder and then when we were put a stop to it it actually made you take a step back and look and say you know what it's it's mad so even like for us to get to australia this year like mm -hmm. for me i'm like taking it in my stride i'm like I'm like, that's why I'm with the way I am with quarantine. Like, it has to be done. And I'm so very lucky to be out here, you know, especially with the way travel has gone. So, you know, it just does really make you, you know, not take anything for granted and just appreciate everything around you. Yeah, that's definitely something for me as well. Just spending time with family that you probably wouldn't normally get to, like, as you said, with your, your sisters. Sarah, something that I actually enjoyed uh, during lockdown. Is she gone? Maybe she is. I don't know. Um, we still have her. Oh, okay, no yeah. problem. Um, I was going to say to Sarah was that uh, her Instagram with her mom doing the walks was was brilliant. Um, <laughs> Sarah, I was saying the Instagram, the, the walks with your mom. Yeah. Oh, my God. I was devastated when she wouldn't come back on Instagram. <laughs> I know, and I was trying to get her like one. Bef I was trying to get her a bit to video her before I went to Australia, just to go through the whole like, how do you feel about your daughter being away for Christmas kind of thing? Because like you know, a typical Irish mommy, the way yeah. they be, like she'd be devastated. Like, but I think, um, yeah, like she's just so normal, and she's like, she gives us a great perspective, like on life, like even when it comes to sports and stuff, like she would just be like. You know, now, lovey, that's enough now about sport. Like, you know, we don't all care about sport that much. You know, <laughs> she kind of brings everyone back to earth, and I think that it's so refreshing to live, have lived with her for the last few months. It was um, just so much crack. But I think it also really taught um, me as well to just be like really consciously aware of being present and like, because we're always thinking about the next thing and what can mm -hmm. we achieve next, what can we do next, and all that. And it just made me stop and like i often like say to myself like i literally snap myself out of it i'm like you know you're thinking too far ahead or you're not thinking about where you are at the moment and mm -hmm. if you do that you're not going to connect to people or you're not going to enjoy other people's company so it's like covid has also taught me to be really present and to have good really good quality conversations with people because you gain an awful lot from that and you can, there's so much you can learn from other people it's just to open your mind up to all these different worlds i suppose you see what you want to see kind of thing so uh, but mum has been great she's just been um she's just so refreshing <laughs> well i hope she makes a comeback now on the instagram i'll be looking out 
So girls, thanks very much for joining us for the little preview of the All-Ireland Ladies Gaelic Football Finals. Little proudly sporting Ladies Gaelic Football, hashtag serious support. You can show your support by tuning in this weekend on TG Cahir. Thank you to my guests, Ashling Sheridan from Cavan, Sarah Rowe from Mayo and Ashling Maloney from Tipperary. Thanks a lot and have a good Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Off the